Yeah, so what we're really going to be doing is re-establishing our performance behaviours, looking at sleep and race plans. So we're going to be looking back at some of the stuff I've already done. We're going to be looking at the goal setting. We're going to be looking at plans, putting that together. It might look in a week, a month, the build up. Then we're going to be incorporating the important aspects of nutrition, which again is hugely important. Robin did a great uh, chat last week and I think she's got one scheduled for next Sunday as well, focusing a bit more around the, the competition stuff, the, the day to day behaviours and training. I think a lot of you had some rightfully so a lot of questions on that and I think she'll be teeing that up well that will link in with this session. We're going to be looking at sleep, the challenges, some key ways to improve, to get better. Um, again, looking back at things I've already looked at, um, but a few, few, few new things. Again, points to challenge you and race plans, a real opportunity to tie it all together. Think about, you know, really building on your goals, your nutrition, your sleep and what you're doing in the day to day and looking at the more site specific stuff that will really set us up for beyond. And I love this picture of the juggling. It really sums up. It's a nice way to think about all the other things that we're coping with in life. We're going to juggle what we're doing on a day to day basis. And a lot of these these foundations, these these cornerstones can really put us in a great place to do that. So first sort of activity I want us to try and do, um, if you all have a go, over the last two sessions, what goals have you set? Or maybe you can take this opportunity to set a new goal. So again, we can just like think about broad categories here. Um, it can be a specific thing. I think you're limited with characters. Um, so that's an outcome, great. Getting PBs, that's a, a good one. Anyone else get anything? Well, here we go. New eating plan, medal at nationals, better sleep. That's good. Again, PBs, snags, sleep, better sleep. Again, working on stamina. That's a good one. Visualizing races. Interesting. Bet underwater. That's a really good skill based one. Nutrition. Again, some key themes coming through there. I think it's some more skill based ones, some good nutrition ones. No, that's good, guys. Medal at snags, that's a great one. Again, just have that outcome goal to eat better. Again, so there's a nice range there. Um, train more than two times. I'm assuming that's the day, potentially. More balanced diet. Improve leg strength. Oh, that's a good one, quite specific. And again, you might be thinking about the um, some of the stuff we looked at both last week with Robin and the first week. Uh, with Zoe and the goal sheets that we gave you. This is a great way to kind of guide you on how to do that. Superstars top 10 finish, I'm guessing that's a neat in between, more balanced diet. Great, that's really good stuff, guys. Um, and it's a really good way to start as we go. So I'm going to move on from there. Engage, re engage that. There we go. So Again, we've got our goals and now the real focus is how can we incorporate that into our plan? So again, if you have a wee think back, there's lots of different ways we can go about doing it. You've got your journals, your to-do lists, the checklist stuff, and the weekly planners, the notes, a reminder on your phone, the note on the wall. Again, again, if you look back or think to what we did um, several times throughout sort of September, October, November, and even if you weren't actually involved then in, you can go on YouTube, it's all there, skim through it. There's some really good stuff around the importance of planning, how you can write it down. I know a lot of uh, my peers actually, ex-teammates, they like the iPad approach where you can actually have journal style stuff, but it's electronic and it gives you a lot of advantages to engage with that. The note on the wall is a great old school one. That again, I know so many athletes rely on but an importance there is to not get too bogged down by an outcome or a time or an end goal the real importance there again is think back to what zoe said about the process and the performance goals that you can set up and how you can use that in your weekly planner or maybe in some sort of list and the phone's a great one there was good reminders um, people talked about apps that they were using i remember in some of the breakout rooms last year we talked about sort of notifications you were setting yourself to actually engage with a routine or a plan on a week to week basis. And I thought it was a really good way to use There's so much technology out there now. You can really take advantage of that. So another wee engagement section, who's used these methods? Or maybe if you haven't used them, who 
what do you think you'll lean towards? Out of the journal, a list, a planner, a phone, note on the wall? There we go, phone. I mean, I'm definitely a phone myself, um, but I do love lists as well. Phone's a big one, overwhelming favourite so far. <laughs> Not really surprising. Oh, interesting. Maybe food for thought for me and Zoe to be thinking about how we can be working in with some of these apps and pieces of technology that are out there now. But no, I mean, it's it's a great one. I mean, you can actually do a lot of this, whether it's your journal, your planning on your phone. I've actually come across a journal entry app that you can make and it sort of dictates so you can talk to it um, and does what a journal would do, but through an app. So there's actually some great stuff out there now. So overwhelming favorite there was the phone. Not really surprising since it's our day-to-day go-to. So really just wanted to touch on how the planners and goals really link in and the real purpose of engaging with it. And again, if I had been a bit more proactive when I was younger, your guy's age, I think I would have been in a much better position. I turned to logbooks and planners and journals more sort of 16, 17, 18. I was a wee bit late to the game. And if I knew about them earlier, I would have been all over it. Um, but the big one is accountability. You know, you're holding yourself accountable on a daily or a weekly basis, you're engaging with the content, your goals, a consistent reminder, whether it is on your phone or we note that you might stick a wee post it. Remember Zoe saying, and you know, there's a few people that might stick it in their, their sock drawer or in the wardrobe. So you only see it every now and again. It's not constantly in your frame of mind. Um, but it really is a great way if you get all this down on paper or in your phone to free up your mind. And I'll come back to that. I remember you guys. Um, well, you might remember me using the term cognitive autonomy, you know, just being automatic, relaxed in yourself and getting it all out of your head and actually putting it down and understanding it. And that's really involved in sort of engaging with your coach and your parents and your peers that kind of links in with the accountability, um, engaging with that. But we'll come back to that a little bit later. But above all else, it's a great form of motivation. Not only if you're setting a goal, and I would encourage you to look at those goal sheets that we've put together myself and Zoe, and you can link that into your nutrition as well. You know, you can use those goal sheets to go about a plan of a process goal um, or a performance goal from a nutrition point of view. And we'll come on to that as well, how you could go about doing it. But above all else, it's a great form of motivation to keep you engaged and understand why you're doing what you're doing. So this is just a wee one slider on the nutrition from last week to let you think about Robin's task. So Robin set a few tasks, sort of optional stuff, but almost homework, but I'd, you know, encourage you to engage with it. She was asking you to try and experiment with snacks, engage in different sort of hydration strategies, you know, try and finish a water bottle throughout the session and think about what you're doing pre and post meal. She talked about the 30 minutes after the session. And I talked about that as well last year, your recovery windows and how you can really incorporate that. And a great way to kind of help you building this is to use those goal sheets you know that we shared you can go through the process of each section and understanding why you're doing what you're doing it might be that you're trying to engage with a more consistent protein intake or you know if someone's work trying to work on your stamina in the pool that came up you might need a bit more calories a bit more of the the right sort of calories and again the goal sheet's a great way to engage with that on a more consistent basis so another little piece of engagement. This, uh, the more astute among you might notice, this is number six in the goal setting sheets. What could prevent you from achieving a goal? Or what's an excuse you could use? That could be the most simple thing. It could be a complex thing. It could be obvious things. Schoolwork, yourself. Interesting. Tiredness, family, homework, yeah, schoolwork too tired I'm too tired can't do it well I hope and I can't do it front if you follow the goal sheet it should be a great way to engage with that school too tired injury yeah that's a fair point can't be bothered I mean honest that's fair enough I mean, we've all been there, too tired, can't be bothered, we've got other stuff going on. The point is, if you can even set aside 30 minutes, an hour even, on a Sunday, you know, you're, if you're committing to a session like this on a Sunday, why not commit a 30-minute window 
at the end of the week and look forward and say, what do I want to achieve this week? Write down a few things or even think more longer term at snags. I think you guys are more than capable of putting together goals, but being aware of these barriers is almost part of the battle. You know, we've all been there. We've all had these challenges, but acknowledging them is almost half the battle to overcome them and understand that, you know, there's stuff out there. There's even a little bit that you engage with is better than nothing at all. And of course, just being a bit more aware of the time that you're committing to each thing. Again, the goal sheets is a great way to go about doing it. So from there, we're gonna go straight into sleep. Now, performance catalyst, performance killer, again, it's a bit dramatic, but it really can be the make or break of young athletes and even senior athletes. It's such an important area. Again, the more astute among you might notice Aberdeen in the background, that that will be the venue for the Thistle Trophy and Snags for Diving at the end of April into May. So we're doing a full tour of the pools across Scotland during this session. Now, the basics. I'm going to come to the sleep, the book on the left, which is really, really good. I'd honestly really advise you all to, to look into it. But the basics are, you know, you've got your circadian rhythm, and that's your reaction to light and dark. It's what our bodies responded to when there was no phones, we had no technology, we would just literally go off light and dark outside. Light, sound, temperature, routine, really important for your sleep. Again, we'll go into these aspects in more detail, but obviously the routine stuff can be what you're doing before bed as well as when you first wake up and what you're doing by the time you get to the pool or school. The stages of sleep, you know, you've got your REM, your light sleep, your, your deep sleep and how these stages repeat and these sort of 90 minute cycles, these windows. But again, there's an importance for each aspect of them. And again, if you can understand the basics, you can really engage with sort of smarter sleep, more successful napping, which is a hugely important aspect for competition scenarios as well as day to day, which we'll get to. But Nick Littlehill, so this person on the left here that's put together almost a sleep guide. It's really accessible information. It's not a long book. Um, very cheap, accessible online. There's lots of used good condition copies. I'd really advise you invest in yourselves. And he's got some great guides on how you can improve your sleep and really get involved in a more proactive way, more practical way. And that's exactly what I'll be doing for putting you guys together, sort of a framework, a usable piece of content. I'll frame it for swimmers, for divers, how you can engage with this in a really understandable way that's not scientific, overly complex. It's just useful, usable information. And if you can nail the sleep and the nutrition, then that's a, you know, it's going to put you in such a great position moving forward to when the racing stuff really gets on top of you and you know all these other aspects. If you can nail this stuff, you know, it really does half the battle. So again, we're not going to dwell on this too much. I just wanted to really emphasize that first little dip there. That's the first 90 minutes your body is engaged in its deepest sleep. And the reason I wanted to emphasize it is because you can actually engage in that in a nap. If a cycle is 90 minutes and you're engaging in the deepest sleep for the deepest recovery, you can actually induce that in a nap situation. So if you're looking for the length of time you should be napping, 90 minutes is a great ballpark. You know, you don't, an hour is a wee bit too short. Two hours can be getting a bit long. You can wake up a bit lethargic, but 90 minutes kind of replicates your body as you see there on the way back up to being closer to being awake and you'll feel more active and aware. And we'll get on to napping in a bit more detail. Quick review of why it's important. Of course, recovery, the hormones that are released in deep sleep. You've got the, the cognitive stuff with your brain, your problem solving, which is related to REM, which is rapid eye movement. So that's just really quite related to your dreaming and just engaging with different parts of your brain. All of these stages are important. You don't want loads and loads of deep sleep, but at the same time, you don't want loads and loads of light sleep. You want to just naturally be in and out of these flows and what you're doing in your environment can really impact that. That's how we're gonna think about improving our sleep. So on that, who can remember how we can improve our sleep? So there's a few things we can think of that could maybe benefit our sleep or what we're doing to improve this whole routine. Great, great start. PMR, that's a great one. Less screen time, yeah, that's really good. Stay off phone before bed. 
don't eat before bed. So we'll actually come back to that because that's not always possible. Read a book, yeah, great stuff. Stay off phone before bed, no phones, stay off TV. Again, great stuff, guys, that's really good. That's exactly what we're looking for. You're remembering well, counting sheep, well, yep, counting sheep, counting backwards, both good stuff. What you eat, yeah, what you eat is really important. We're actually gonna push that for Robin next week to kind of link up sleeping and nutrition and also kind of nutrition from a, a racing point of view and competition. So again, if you maybe wanna to think towards the end, if you want me to suggest anything for Robin, just at the back of your mind, you can fire it in the chat or, you know, towards the end and we can pass that on for sort of the stuff. If you anything around nutrition that you guys want to hear or learn more about, less tech before bed, yep, yeah, great. So from that, you nailed all the big ones, guys. You did really well and remembered what we talked about last year, reducing social media, all the other stuff, you know, schoolwork can actually come up there, but just being a bit aware of what you're doing before bed, of course, on your phone and your TV, but don't spend too late at night going over homework or stuff because that can get a bit intense. The routine, time to bed, the timings of the meals. So again, if we think about, again, the book that Nick has put together talks a lot about your 45 or hour before you go to bed, but also when you wake up, you know, some really great useful tips that I'll share with you on how to improve and optimize your sleeping both in the run-up to actually trying to go to bed and also when you wake up when you're at the pool or at the competition venue at school. And of course, optimize your environment. You want it to be cool, not freezing cold that you're actually shaking, but obviously cooler, you know, turn your radiator down a little bit maybe if the house is quite hot, dark, quiet, comfortable. You can get an eye mask and earplugs if your room's maybe not ideal. Maybe experiment with your sheets. Again, sometimes the sheets can cause a bit of irritation. These things might seem basic, but they can make a big difference. And again, just being organized. If you've got stuff rattling around in your head, sometimes if I can't sleep, I'll just get up, write down whatever I'm thinking, and then it kind of stops me thinking about it. Seems very simple, but it's actually worked quite a few times and sort of gets me out of bed, gets me out of the environment, and I'm not you know, worrying about not sleeping. And of course, napping can be a great booster, but we'll come to that in a more competition focus. And again, this stuff, again, you nailed the PMR. Um, I think there was a visualization in there actually as well, counting backwards, we had counting sheep, but counting backwards, some of the grounding techniques that uh, Zoe has referenced and will continue to reference as we move into the next few weeks is a great one. Um, and we've also got expressing, of course, through diaries or journals, just generally being more organized. Again, having less of the school stuff in our head and more of a kind of an acute plan that we've got and understanding the purpose of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then the breathing as well. You know, if you really are lying there, that links quite well with PMR. Being a bit overwhelmed, just long, slow breaths can really help improve. But getting the environment locked down itself and a routine around of when you're going to bed can actually be the most easy part right off the bat to, to improving what you're doing. And the last bit before we move on is diet and sleep and the training and competition kind of stuff. Again, Robin talked a lot around what we're doing sort of the three hours before, you know, don't want to have too big a meal before bed. Sometimes not possible if we've got a training session, maybe say till eight or half eight in the evening. What you can do then is maybe have a meal at maybe five o'clock and then a snack when you get out of the pool in the car on the way home, just a lighter meal before bed. Um, but a really big one that I wanted to focus on was the napping, especially around school. You know, let's say you're napping at like five. That's actually a great time before you're training at around, say, six o'clock. You could have a four o'clock or a five o'clock p.m. nap. And that can be hugely beneficial and set you up for the session. And again, even like a little 20 minute or 30 minute nap can make a huge difference. You don't need to be thinking about a full 90 minute cycle, but it won't affect your sleep at night. And it, but it can be really effective to kind of get you in a better frame of mind for training. And again, of course, that came up last week around planning. You know, write down what works at a competition food-wise or nap-wise and write down what went well, what didn't, and try and understand it. And then if you write it down, even like a scribble or a few notes on your phone, you'll be in a better position down the line to actually make a bit of an actionable change to that and actually say, well, oh, I can change my plan. I can change my goals around that really is learning from your experience and that trial and error that makes the biggest difference. 
So kind of the last main topic, I think there's two or three more points where you can engage from here. Race plans, it really does tie it all together. We've got our goals, we've got our nutrition and our sleep really underpinning it all. We want to be organized and practice. That's the biggest aspect. At least have a rough plan put together. You know what you're doing and you can develop it and build on it. Again, if I'd been a bit more aware when I was younger, I could have sort of nailed my race plan far earlier than I did when I was in my kind of 15, 16, even into my 20s, it took me. I work with athletes right now at the university and they still don't really know what they're doing. They're not really fully aware of all of this stuff and you guys being on it and being engaged with this now, again, even if you take a little bit away from it, it's gonna put you in such a good position moving forward. And this is really what the plans are all about, the race plans. We've got our goals, our coach input, which is just as important, helping you set realistic goals, making sure that you're updating your goals. Are they realistic for you? They're not too easy, but they're not too difficult. The process and performance related goals, it might be this week I want to drink my bottle or finish my water bottle at the end of every session. And that'll feed towards the end performance outcome goal of having a better, of outcome of the week as a whole training wise or achieving a higher volume i know stamina came up as a goal that links in quite well nutrition and sleep just eating better a balanced diet all of this comes under your race plan because if you nail it earlier it feeds in for when things do get more intense in those race environments checklist of course and I wonder if any of you remember what ppr is and as we went over those in depth but it's your pre-performance routine so again that links in well with the routines that we talked about for sleep, but the PPR, your pre-performance routine is very important. So, got plenty there. What's important for a race plan? No wrong answer here. What should you be considering? It can be anything. It can be what you're eating in the day, maybe what you're doing actually at the pool, your warm-up routine. What are we thinking? Positive mentality, sleep, stretching, pre-pool, rough timings of, event, of events. Yeah, that's a great one. Nutrition, stretching, yeah, land warm-ups, mindset, love it. Sticking to the routine, sleep the night before, yeah. Back-to-back -back swims, again, we talked about a big schedule. I remember last season there was a few points we were talking about the intense schedules and lots of you know, back to back things, what we can be doing, working on injury. Yep, yeah, well, that can happen. Meal sizes and times. Yep. Yeah. That's really good stuff, guys. Good foods, pre pool, high calories. Yep, yeah, well, as long as they're the right calories, uh, meal sizes and timings. Yeah, it's really good stuff, guys. So there's the overview of what a plan could look like. You know, we've got that's about 36 hours before roughly you've got your overarching goal to be in the right physical mental and emotional performance state the day before what are you up to you know chat with the coach there's nap there's mental rehearsal a lot we talked there's a few about mindset there if you think about your imagery your visualization good nutrition of course pack your bag get your stuff together morning what you're doing the pre-pool the routine your breakfast at the venue and that's your kind of specific prep that really does come under your kind of your pre-pool um which is very much part of a pre-performance routine you can argue this whole thing is part of a pre-performance routine you know music on getting ready again just an example of what you can do there's no right or wrong approach but actually engaging with this is almost a form of a form sorry of mental rehearsal and getting yourself in the right frame of mind and of course nutrition having the stuff packed in your bag. This is just examples I used, and this is a list that I refined. And as I used it, again, I spent the time, it took me about half an hour to put this together, I remember. And then when I got better and better at using it, I needed it less and less, till eventually I just knew what I needed. But at the start, it really helped. And even now, I know people in their sort of early 20s who still don't bring the right stuff, they forget things, they're running low on snacks, on fuel, and, you know, it's so easily avoidable if you just go out of your way and have a little bit of a planning element and it can really ground you. But above all else, things can go wrong. 
and do go wrong. It's almost an inevitability. You know, you can be Mr. Plan, Mrs. Plan. You can have the absolute routine dialed in, you know, exactly what you're going to do, the timings of it. I know a lot of you talked about timings there, but even observing at uh, the meet of the weekend, timings can really be thrown off and things can go wrong. So what can we do to prepare for things going wrong? So we've got a more difficult question. See if you can remember what we can do. Can be anything guys, you know, there can just be a few. Okay, yeah, visualization, that's a great one. Task simulation, well done, <laughs> wasn't expecting that. That's really well remembered. Plan, yep, pray. Play, pray is a great form of a, uh, sort of, it's actually arguably a form of visualization. Plan, positive mindset, task simulation. Create a what if plan, that's really good for when things go wrong, those scenarios. Breathing exercises, allow extra time, that's a great one. Yeah, nice. Practice, cry. Well, hope not many of you are crying. Whatever you need to do, not let it be negative yet, that's good. Including planning. Negative. That's really good stuff, guys. Not stress yet. Great. Now that's some really good stuff that's come through there. So already lots of you nailed the, the really important stuff, which was the visualization, the task simulation, the self-talk, um, which kind of links in. And then obviously those pre-performance routines. And off the back of the weekend, I think one of the most important things or the takeaways was what I was observing watching the racing is how far off the schedule they were you know, sometimes 20 minutes, 30 minutes even away from when a call time actually was. You know, I'd be flicking on to expect to be watching, say, the 200 Butterfly, and there were sort of three or four events behind almost. And I'm thinking, wow, what are the people in the call room going through? What's on their mind? Like, how are they coping with this situation? And it makes me think back to situations that I've been in and how you really have to, have to adapt your plan. And what if you've had a snack and you're starting to get hungry again? All these things are really worth considering. And if you can visualize or task simulate, it could be a really great way to set yourself up for things going wrong. Like the what if plan that one of you mentioned. I wanted to share an example um, with one of my teammates actually, who it was in Sheffield um, and he's working with one of the psychologists at Edinburgh. This is a really interesting example because with permission from the psychologist and his coach, this person in particular, is extremely well planned. They've really put together, they've been doing it for so long, they know exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it. Almost to the point where when one thing does go wrong, it really throws them. So they took advantage of that situation. And again, this was premeditated to a point, but they didn't know exactly what would go on. The coach actually hid their trunks, their race suit. So it was an hour before, it was the heat of the, the event and the coach deliberately went into his bag and took his race suit from him. And of course, this completely threw him. He was flat, they thought he'd left it in the uh, hotel room. And in this instance, he didn't actually have a spare suit with him. He only brought one. And then right off the bat is 101, what not to do. Don't not bring a spare suit with you. And I think he almost, I think the head coach actually knew that. And it's probably one of the reasons why he chose to pick a suit and remove it. So all he had was trunks and he'd almost accepted the fact that, okay, right, trunks this is what I'm gonna have to go with. This is the situation. I'm just going to have to accept it for what it is. And obviously, of course, the coach eventually gave the suit back. But that's an extreme version of task simulation. Like the extreme version with Michael Phelps there when his goggles came off an event. But what I should say is that the individual, because they've been working with a psychologist, they've been working in their visualization. Um, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, but it was Scott Gibson who actually went on to break the Scottish record in the 50 backstroke in that heat. And that was with an extremely stressful scenario of not having a race suit, thinking that he'd left at the hotel and he was going to have to race in his trunks. Again, an extreme situation, but it's that task simulation and planning for when things go wrong that's the most important learning there. You know, if you think to kind of actually laying out that plan, that in itself is a great way 
to kind of break down what you're doing and why you're doing it. Writing down stuff is actually a form of task simulation and visualizing for when stuff goes wrong. All these things kind of interconnect. If you're actually going about the process of breaking it down, understanding it, you are essentially task simulating. You're essentially visualizing as you're writing, thinking about what could be going wrong. And it all links into your pre-performance routine. And all this stuff tees up quite well for the kind of weeks to come. Again, this is one of the more important reminder sessions to connect the goals, the nutrition, the sleep, the real cornerstone stuff that'll set us up for the real sort of nitty gritty performance related things moving into next week where we're looking at you know, the competition nutrition and then myself and Zoe again the weeks after looking at peak performance day of and what we can be doing. And again, keeping this interactive element of just engaging with the, the content. So, you know, we've done full circle. We've come to, started in Toll Cross. We went to um, up in Aberdeen and then we're in Royal Commonwealth Pool and then we're back in Toll Cross. And, you know, really the overarching importance of today's session was, like I said, connecting all together. The goal setting, the plans, incorporating the nutrition elements, which are so important. Again, Robin put together some great content last week, and I'm sure she'll do the same again next week. So make sure you're involved and you tune in. And if you haven't engaged with some of Robin's tasks, maybe think back and say, well, what can I be doing differently this week into next week? What can I be doing around my race plans? What can I be thinking about from a nutrition point of view or goal setting to adapt my race plan? What can I be doing to maybe make my sleeping environment that little bit better? Is my environment maybe a bit too warm? Is it uncomfortable? Or am I on my phone too late? You know, maybe just try saying to yourself, right, I'm going to set an alarm for 30 minutes before bed. And that's when I put my phone down, start reading. What are you going to do to challenge yourself in the next week? Even if it's just one thing, you don't need to get bogged down by it. Right, I need to do everything. It needs to be in this way, that way. All this content is up online, guys, and you can look back at it. You can re-refer to it. And that is the most important aspect of all of this. It's all re-engageable content. Just because we tell you about one thing and that's you told, we're not expecting you to be able to immediately do it and then immediately just learn it and understand it and never refer to it again. You know, it's great that you're thinking back about PMR and visualization. Again, these are difficult things. And again, just looking back at some of the content and engaging with it even a little bit is going to help you in the long run. That's really what I would challenge you to do to put it together from now is just go out of your way to try and engage with this content, set yourselves up for nutrition, and hopefully in the next few weeks we can really sort of push on into the real nitty gritty performance related stuff. So that's all the main content I wanted to look at today, guys. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. If any of you want anything for next week, for Robin, um, fire it in the chat. It can just be maybe just two words like nutrition and competition, something like that, or even anything that you want myself or Zoe to talk about in the weeks to come. Um, more than happy to take those comments or just any question at all around what we've done so far. Um, that'd be really helpful. Otherwise, um, I hope you all enjoyed that and took away a little bit even if it's just like i said one or two things that's really good otherwise um you know all good and that's all we've got for this evening well under time actually <laughs> makes a big difference when we don't have breakout rooms we've got any questions at all or if anyone wants to pop in a theme maybe for next week All good. Zoe, what's a good time to have a nap? Oh, that's a really good one, actually. Nerves and how to deal with them. So, Zoe, you might, if you're able to come in on some of these, particularly the nerves is a great one, but good time to have a nap is actually really important um, because the naps. So, let's say, let's take the school example. Let's say you've got school all day and then you've got training, say, in the evening. If you can nap between sort of 4 to 5 p.m. for sort of 20 to 30 minutes, that can be a really great time to kind of engage with a nap and it'll top you up for the session. And at a competition, I was actually talking to some of the athletes in Ireland. 
they were sleeping right in the middle of the day, getting that 90 minute cycle. So they would have an alarm set for 12 or one o'clock to two o'clock, depending on when they got back from the hotel. And they were getting that full 90 minute cycle in. So that's a great one at a competition. I'd really advise you to try and get a 90 minute nap. But the day to day, if you're at school and you're just completely drained, a 20 minute, 30 minute before school is a great one. So nerves and how to deal with them is a really big one. That's definitely one that I can touch on a little bit now, but we can focus more on in the weeks to come, um, particularly around that's right in Zoe's speciality. So the grounding techniques that we talked about, you know, the self-talk, which again, we'll be talking about what you can say to yourself and understanding that having negative thoughts probably links in underneath actually practicing reconstructing negative thoughts. For me, you can't just block a negative thought and then it just will go away. That's not really how it works. You can, almost the form of accepting it is a bit more of a productive way to do it. So understand that the negative thought is there, but almost reframing it. So if we think of how can I flip this to something that's more actionable? So rather than a threat, it becomes a challenge for me to overcome. So nerves was a huge one for me. Nerves was a massive issue. And for me, I used to, I actually really engage with music as part of my visualization and I really engage with music to kind of help control my nerves, my heart rate, and almost accept the fact that sometimes I just get really nervous. But if I can flip this and channel it in the right way into the pool, into that environment, it's going to put me in a great position. And I'll tell you, some of the most sort of successful races I had as an athlete were when I was at my most nervous, but I just understood it for what it was. And it really was negative at times, you know, during the day I couldn't sleep. I was just hung up on it, but I just channeled it in a way. And again, I just learned by doing, accepting it for what it was. What are the go-to uh, race snacks? And we will come back to that stuff, guys. We'll make sure we include that in the sessions to come. Um, what are the go-to snacks for pre-race? So that's a really good one. Bananas are an absolute win, in my opinion. And um, they're really good sort of healthy sugar release. And I know Robin backed that up last week. Um, you don't want to have anything too heavy, like, you know, too close to a race, sort of 60 minutes before. If you're having something like a cereal bar can actually be quite nut dense, which can be a little bit too much. A banana is much more digestible, um, easier to work with, or even like a jam sandwich with wholemeal bread is a great one. Um, but again, you need to learn what works for you. Some people need something a bit more substantial maybe a bowl of cereal before you get to the pool. Um, but again, banana sandwich is obviously an absolute go-to and you can't really go wrong with it. Um, and there's good forms of sort of liquid energy. You know, your uh, Lucozades, you've got different energy juices. And by energy juice, I mean sort of the good sort of fruit juices, not like the smoothies, you know, we talked about. A really good go-to for me was sort of small amount of oats, frozen berries and water for definitely not milk before a race because milk can be a bit much. Um, again, just really good sugars, healthy, natural sugars that can release before the race. But always make sure it's kind of an hour or earlier because if you have it any time closer, it can really start to affect your race. Um, but again, if we hold those thoughts moving forward, then we'll definitely frame that for uh, Robin next week. I'll make sure she includes some more go-to snacks. And last one, we've got priorities, school versus training, how they impact each other. So again, that's a huge challenge. Um, no worries, Phoebe. Um, the school versus training stuff is a massive one. I mean, I remember it vividly going through it. Um, Zoe did swim for a while, I'm sure, sure she will as well. But, you know, it really is always a factor. But the planning stuff again it sounds boring but see if you have a rough idea of how to set about time during the day even if it's like 30 minutes after school before I train I'm just going to do a bit of homework even if it's just a small amount that's enough to kind of satisfy the need in your head and you're not going to feel guilty for not doing it I used to have a real issue with that feeling guilty that I wasn't doing enough school work or school work was compromising training it really is a balance. Remember at the start, I showed you that image of juggling. You know, life is going to be like that. You know, you're, you're going to have great opportunities in the summer and in the future when you're going to be able to just focus on something potentially. But sometimes 
learning to juggle balance is just part of it. Unfortunately, you know, you're going to have to have this sliding scale of what you prioritize. It might be in one instance, right, schoolwork today or over the weekend is just going to have to take priority. Or I've not got a huge amount of time, I'm just going to have to be quite purposeful with what I'm doing. Like if I'm sitting down at my desk, I'm actually going to do work, put my phone away and just crack on with what I need to do. And that for me, just bring out a simple list of saying, what do I want to achieve today? Get through my chemistry, get through this homework, this assignment, this uni course work, and then just cross it off. And there's just a satisfaction in that. Um, so yeah, how they impact each other, it really can be uh, a kind of a to and fro, but again, learn what works for you in different environments or different ways to, to work. What I would say is with schoolwork, don't go more than an hour without taking a break. Again, Nick, the book that we showed earlier, Sleep, um, he actually talks about some really useful stuff about how being sort of productive in work and in school relates strongly with sleep, but also just rest. You don't necessarily need to be napping, but just taking 15, 20 minutes away from your phone or away from something can make a huge difference on how you prioritize. For me, 30 minutes of productive work is far better than sort of an hour and a half or two hours of average work you know, whether it's school or anything that I'm doing. And really just saying to yourself, if I just sit down and do this, like I said, for 20, 30 minutes before going to training, you can then just focus on the actual training side of things. And again, it's a skill learning to do it, sort of switching that flick in your head to say, right, school work for 30 minutes, flick it off, right, off we go to the pool and leave it at the door. That's the best way I can describe it when you get to the pool. If you're in the pool and you're still thinking about school, you know, that's when you really need to engage with being a bit more organized and planning what you're doing. Because the best sessions that you have, you're not going to be thinking about school. You're not going to be thinking about much. You know, you're going to be in an automatic, free-flowing state. So again, if you're getting a bit bogged down with stuff and you're overthinking things, again, maybe that's a wee bit of an alarm bell to to kind of wake you up and say, right, I need to engage with this stuff a wee bit more. I know a lot of us said a challenge or a barrier could be, can't be bothered. Well, maybe that in itself is part of the problem. You need to say to yourself, well, I'm going to hold myself accountable and do something about it. So, yeah, it's the best way I can say is try and leave it at the door, respectively. Just try and engage with school, leave it at the door, engage with training, leave school at the door, vice versa. Um, and that really is the best way to go about it. So... I know I went to some of those questions in more depth than others, um, but noted about the nerves and how to deal with them. Again, that's right up Zoe Street. We'll be sure that she engages with that two weeks time and snacks, what to go for pre-race and on the day. I'll make sure Robin engages with that content. I think she was going to focus on that anyway, sort of a more competition mindset, which is what the next three sessions will be, really looking at what we're doing um, to prepare and kind of reconstructing those negative thoughts. I'll, again, myself and Zoe will make sure we kind of lay it in an approachable way of how to kind of reframe your thoughts, that negative to positive kind of stuff, um, and we'll take it from there. So looks like no more questions, and I've talked far too much for this evening. And again, thank you very much all for engaging with that content. Um, hope to see you all next week for Robin. Um, for the next nutrition talk and maybe the weeks to come and yeah great session guys thanks very much for engaging and taking your time out and if you do one thing this week um that's better than none at all <laughs>